chapter 3, verse 12. He says, you know, he, he looked this way and that way, and nobody was looking, so he killed that Egyptian, buried him in the sand. How many of us have found ourselves looking this way and that way? Think we're going to get away with it? We might even get away with it in the flesh, but if there's anything I know about sand, is that the wind blows it around, and the stuff that's buried underneath gets revealed. And it's the same with our sin, that our sin will find you out. But the, the, um, for those few statements, those, just those few statements spanned 40 years of Moses' life. When he realized that his deed had become known, he flees to Midian. When we read these accounts and consider the images that are conjured up of Moses, either in Egypt or at the well in Midian, um, meeting Ruel, I don't know about you, but for me, it's a colorized version of Charlton Heston. But the climax of those 40 years is where we should hear the first record scratch. That <laughs> Looking more closely at Exodus 2.10, we realize that Moses spent three, maybe four years with his parents. Just three or four years. Yet 40 years later, what his parents poured into him still resonated with him. He, he lived in all that luxury. I don't know, how many, did anyone have a chance to see the King Tut display when they traveled the U.S.? Do you have a few hands? King Tutankhamun was actually one of the lesser kings. But that menagerie of stuff was amazing. And Moses grew up in that. All that temptation, all that power that was put in front of his face as a young, as a young child growing up, as a teenager. Yet, he still identified with the slaves, with his Hebrew brethren. In Exodus 2.12, there's an interesting statement. And let's, let's oh, well, actually, I just did that. Ha <laughs> ha, that's my notes. All right, so let's flash forward another 40 years. So Jesus, Moses, is in Midian. He's been serving alongside Ruel, raising his sheep. Um, if you put this together, he's fleed from Egypt because he's worried that, well, he knows that King, the Pharaoh was trying to, wanting to kill him. So Moses was serving as a shepherd while he was on the lamb. Just thought I'd give you that one. <laughs> All right. So he's taken a wife, Zipporah. He's, she's the daughter of Ruel. Ruel is the, the priest of Midian. And Ruel means it's friend of God. This is his name. He's also referred to as um, Jethro. Yep. But uh, Jethro means eminent or excellent. It's probably more of a title. He was the priest of Midian. Uh, Forty years in the backside of the desert. Forty years thinking about all those luxuries that he walked away from. That scepter that was out there in front of him that he could almost grasp. Forty years hanging onto a staff that could have been that scepter. Then in Exodus chapter 3, it happens fast in the book. In Exodus chapter 3, it brings him to the burning bush. You know the scene. Charlton, has, I, I mean, Moses <laughs> notices a bush on fire, but it's not being consumed. Now, he'd been roaming these hillsides for 40 years. He knew every nook, cranny, rock, like the back of his hand. The burning bush thing, that's a tad bit different. Now, imagine, we all have our usual haunts, um, places we frequent. We can close our eyes, we can trace every object, every nuance of that space. In high school, you hopped into the car with your one friend that had a car. 
you kind of got comfortable. You cruised the strip on a Friday night seven, 12 times because it was cool. Y'all may not know this, this is cool. <laughs> Maybe COVID messed that up for you guys, but. So you pull out of the, you, you pull out of the Sonic and you turn and you look to your right, just past the, the, the Quickie Mart. And there's a burning bush on the side of the Quickie Mart. I mean, this is something interesting. You want to talk about this, you go over, you check it out. But what's even more amazing is the bush knows your name. It says, Moses. Wow. <laughs> Page turns. Then he learns that this is, this is uh, the Lord speaking to him. He says, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> Wrong movie. <clears> he <throat> says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then he learns that God's also been thinking about the deliverance of the Hebrew slaves in Egypt. And he wants Moses to do it. No, Moses has questions. That's where we pick it up. We're going to go to Exodus 3, 11. But Moses said to God, who am I? I mean, how can, how can you imagine that I'm going to go down there and free the slaves? I mean, my, my picture's in the post office in Egypt. I can't show my face down there. But God assures him in verse 12 that he's going to be with him. He's going to go with him. But then Moses, really kind of another record scratch. Moses is like, uh, have you considered this, that when I go down there and see them, that they're not going to hear me? They're not going to know, not going to believe me? Who should I tell them sent me? In other words, Moses is saying, who are you? <laughs> this is where we get the first place where God tells us the closest thing we have to his name, because this came from God directly. He says, I am who I am. You can wrestle that through all the grammar idioms of, of Hebrew. No, I'm not a scholar. I read the other people. But any way you look at it, there's only two ways that I am could mean. It's either a statement of doing or a statement of being. Either way, the Lord is anything we need him to be. He becomes whatever we need to be. He will whatever he wants to be. This is the same statement, I am, in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers come to arrest, 600 soldiers come to arrest uh, Jesus. And Jesus asked them, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. He said, King James tells us, I am he. But if you notice, the he is in italics. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am. And the whole cohort fell on their butts from the power of that name. I'm not making it up. Check it out. <laughs> hmm. So there are three questions that we're dealing with. Still at the burning bush, Moses seems to have no limit to his excuses. God's thinking, I, I, I told him I was going to send him to Egypt, and he says, who am I? I told him I was going to go with him, and he says, who are you? Uh, let's, let's start with something simple. Moses, what's that in your hand? Moses says, a stick. Good. Let's start there. Moses knew the feel of that staff. He knew every curve, every knot, every nick. He knew how to brace himself with it. He knew the smooth parts that were polished by the lanolin from the sheep. He knew how to prod a stubborn ewe. He knew it so well that he didn't know it at all. It wasn't until he threw it down before the Lord that he realized what he'd been carrying all those years. It wasn't so much, it was so much more than a dead stick a rod, a staff. The three questions, who am I? 
Who are you? And what's in your hand? If you answer the third question based on who you are, we fall short. When we consider that third question in the light of who he is, it's limitless. Incidentally, um, once Moses finally resigned himself to, all right, all right, I'll be the deliverer. He set out on his way, and he, and he didn't take that dead stick with him. He took, let's see, what, uh, Exodus 4.20 tells us it had become the rod of God to him. So we all have excuses. When we see Mo, uh, Moses mounting up these excuses, <laughs> He's not the right guy for the job, he says. Don't we all do this? You're, in the, you're, you're finishing up the, your burger, cleaning up the water burger table, you know, collect your trash, start heading to the trash can on your way out the door, and the Lord talks to you. He says, see that person sitting alone at the back table? Go tell them I love him. I'm like, Lord, I only had a few minutes for that avocado bacon burger. I'm all cleaned up. I've got my hand on the door. We all have excuses. Yours may not be an avocado bacon burger. Moses, he hid behind incorrect theology. Moses, I don't want to help you do this through me. I want to do it through you. I want to do it through you. Moses hid behind insufficient knowledge. <laughs> it's not what you know that counts. It's who you know. Moses hid behind an inferior self-concept. It's not who you are that matters. It's who I am. Moses hid behind in, inadequate uh, ability to speak. <laughs> it's not your abilities that counts. It's his. Moses hid behind incomplete trust. Send someone else. God always has a man or a woman ready when he needs one. And Esther, to such a time as this, for Elijah, you're not alone. I've got 7,000 more that have not bent the knee to die. We shouldn't be too hard on Moses, though. We've been in the same position. We say, I can't do this. God says, let me do it through you. We say, I don't know enough. He says, you know me. That's enough. We say, no one will respect me. God says, that's not important. What's important is that they respect me. And we say, I don't have the ability. God says, my grace is sufficient. It's my ability that counts. And we say, God, send someone else. God says, it's not a request. When we feel inadequate to do the things that God desires, we can be encouraged by the ways that God used Moses, met his needs, answered his questions, addressed his fears. We never know what God might be doing through us, when we're going to be ready. So another question is why? Those three letters. <laughs> when you take that journey with Moses and Aaron into, into Egypt, we really don't know much about their method of travel. In my imagination, they took dromedary airlines. They had a quiet landing. They Ubered to the palace. They've had their first let my people go conversation with Pharaoh. And to which he replies, I don't know this God. You know, nor will I let Israel go. On top of that, the Israelites, to the Israelites, Pharaoh adds the responsibility of collecting their own straw to make the brick, bricks, and he doesn't reduce their daily quota of bricks. You can imagine the Israelites got a little upset. They come to Moses. They blame him. <sighs> Moses passes the buck. In Exodus 5.22, we get a flavor of the response that Moses had to the Lord, asking why. It 
See if this sounds like Moses. Lord, why have you brought trouble to this people? Why is it that you've sent me for, since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name? He's done evil against these people. <laughs> Neither have you delivered your people at all. Do you think that was Moses' attitude? How many times have we found ourselves pointing a finger at God? Keeping in mind the numbers, I don't have a slide for this one, 12-3. This is where Miriam and, and, and uh, Aaron are arguing with, with Moses, angry, because they believe that he holds himself up as, as a better prophet or more important than the two of them. Now, there is a parenthetical here. Got to take into the note that Numbers, the book of Numbers, was also written by Moses. <laughs> but in, in, Exodus, uh, sorry, in Numbers 12, 3, Moses writes, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men on the face of the earth. He was humble. The Holy Spirit prompted him to put that in there. I think that verse was more like, Lord, why? You made promises. I believe you. I trust you. Look, I'm here. What are we doing? Where do we go from here? I think that's really what's conveyed in uh, 522. Joshua cried out, Alas, Lord, why have you brought this people over to the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites? To destroy us? Moses wasn't alone. Gideon cried, why then has all this happened to us? Nehemiah said, Why is the house of God forsaken? Job cried out, Why did I not die at birth? David prayed, Why are you so far away from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Jesus on the cross cried out, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Graham Lotz, she put it very well. She said, if we don't figure out how to process the whys of life, we'll end up cynical, resulting in a catastrophic loss of faith. We can bring our whys to the Lord. There's even a time to be angry with the Lord. He knows our frame. He understands our hearts. The key to Moses here is his obedience. In Numbers 20, we see Moses learning the hard way about controlling his anger and misrepresenting God, striking the rock for water instead of speaking to it as he was instructed. This is the second time that he brought water from the rock. He didn't have to prove anything. The Lord was their provider in the desert. Yet even after... You know, God, forbade, God forbade him to, from entering the promised land. Even after he had nothing to gain from a human perspective, even though he would not be able to enjoy the fruits of his labor all those years, leading this multitude, millions of people. Uh, it says 600,000 men, putting wives, kids in there. We're talking two, three million people. The population of Dallas, uh, as of the last census, was basically 1.3 million. So twice the size of Dallas, roaming through the desert. And Moses, they hold him up to be the provider for them, the representation of God. Even though all of that labor, Moses remained faithfully obedient. Faithful to God and his work for 50 more chapters before he wrote the book. He didn't know how long this was going to take the author of Hebrews offers a summary of Moses' life. This is, I don't have a slide for this, this is Hebrews 11, 26 and 27. He, speaking to Moses, regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He preserved, he persevered because he saw him who was invisible. It's kind of hard to put 120 years of life into a Sunday. We're, 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 we're journeying on.
Yes, Moses did live 120 years. At the end of his life, in um, Deuteronomy, the end of Deuteronomy, what is that, 34? I had it on the slide earlier. This is where we, he, we see Moses told, these are your final days, go up on the mountain, take a look at the promised land, and then I'm going to take you home. We don't, know where he, we don't know where Moses' bones were buried. It says the Lord took him and buried him. <laughs> we're going to continue cherry-picking through the first 80 years, but with 120 years, I've seen a couple of summaries. Moses took 40 years to think he was something, another 40 years to learn he was nothing. And 40 years to realize that God can do anything. Another one was God took 40 years to make him, another 40 years to break him, and waited 40 more years to take him. So we can see a lot of ourselves lived out through Moses the trials, the triumphs, his service to the Lord. But I think the turning point was that burning bush. This is when I believe that it was that realization that God can take what we consider to be inconsequential. I may have to put that in my 50 cent bag. Inconsequential. Um, ordinary. Good for nothing. And make it an instrument that will turn the Nile River to blood. To turn the dust of the land of Egypt to lice. To which the Egyptians said, this is the finger of God. Moses would hold up that staff and part the Red Sea, ushering the Israel into safety. He would hold it up again in a battle against the Amalekites, and as long as he raised it up, they would have victory. A few years after this, in Moses, uh, sorry, in Aaron's care, that staff would bud, bloom, bring forth flowers, leaves, and almonds. Moses had no idea what he'd been carrying. It took 80 years. It took Moses 80 years for God to put that staff in his hand. Moses, what's in your hand? A stick. Yet it became the rod of God. Samson, what's in your hand? The jawbone of an ass. No. No. It's a weapon to slay a thousand Philistines. David, a slingshot. If you put a rock in there, a junior high kid can defeat a giant and change the course of a nation. Peter, what's in your hand? A fishing net. Lay it down, and I'll make you a fisher of men. What do you have? Five loaves? Two fishes? What are these among so many? Bring them to me. We all have talents and giftings from the Lord, and like Moses, we can get to the same place. Many of us have been holding on to these things for too long. We take them for granted. We're measuring them by who we are. What could they become if we surrendered ourselves and we laid them down at the Lord's feet? We let him show us <laughs> what they were intended for all along. Over time, we, we lose the magic and the wonder of God's presence. We overlook the truth of his sovereignty. But the Lord is infinitely patient with us. It can take him 10 years, 20, 30 years to move in our life. <laughs> to put something in our hand that may have been there all along. God didn't ask Moses, what's in your hand, because he didn't know. Adam, where are you? God knew. He asked Moses because Moses didn't know what it was. And Moses, to Moses, it was a reminder of failure, the monotony of failure. The wanted poster in Egypt. It could have been the scepter of Egypt in his hand. But no. 
What's in your hand? Abraham, Joseph, hmm. Moses, Daniel, David, none of these were pastors or teachers. They were administrators. They stood next to the person in power. But they were faithful. They changed the course of nations because they were humble with what they were given. They were loyal with their duties, their business, their talents. They understood the place where they stood. The place that God called them to be. And they let God have their way in it. So the question I'll leave you with, what's in your hand? Is it a hammer? A wrench? A computer? A stethoscope? Do you have a gift of music? A piece of chalk? A ballot slip in a vote? A conversation? A child? Parents? Grandparents? Is that a little boy? A little girl? A Whitfield? A Deborah? Sometimes we need to step back. We need to take that deep breath and say, Lord, hmm, open my eyes afresh. James is always telling us, take a look at this with fresh eyes. I've forgotten the wonder of it all. I've, I've, I've lost hold of the fact that you give us, load us up with new benefits every morning. I'm not throwing down the scent of things that I should have. I'm not throwing down the things that you've put in my hand that I've taken for granted. And see if you'll give new life to them. <laughs> Moses knew that staff so well, he didn't know it at all. What do you have that you can throw down in front of the Lord? That you can give over to Him? You can see what He does with it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that you've heard these things. We know, Lord, that you know each of our hearts. Lord, cause that stirring in each of us. Lead us, Lord, into an inventory of our lives, of the talents, of the giftings, of what we think is the ordinary in our lives, Lord. Give us a new vision, Lord, of where you want us to be, a new perception, Lord, of why you've placed us where you've placed us. Help us to be, Lord, more like, dare I say Moses, more like Jesus. Bless us, Lord, with, with the longing that we have to live out the way, a life like Moses had. We're so grateful for his example, Lord, that you've covered him so well in your word, that his, your spirit, Lord, blessed him so much that he could put these, his life on paper for us to study. As we open the doors and leave the day, today, Lord, Help us step into a new perception of what you've put in our hands. We love you, Lord, and we trust you with all that we have. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If, you've, um, if you're here today, you're new, and you haven't put your trust in the Lord, um, I will be in the back. Pastor James will be in the back. We have elders who would love to pray with you to have the privilege of, of leading you to the Lord, to give you a Bible, some apps. And then, Lord, thank, and thank you all for coming. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Have a great day.